about Ryan McGuffey. This was a podcast we were not expecting to do. We had a podcast idea. We were about to tape it. Aloy Jimenez speaks to the media, and all of a sudden we realized, you know what? We got to talk about what Aloy spoke about on this Zoom with reporters because there were a couple of things that surprised us. Let's begin with what position he's going to play because it certainly seemed seen by what we were hearing from Pedro Grafal that he was going to be, talking about Aloy, full-time DH, a little bit of right field. Aloy seems to be thinking something different right now. Yeah, I mean, he said he's training to be an outfielder. And the DH question was asked six times, seven different ways-ish. Um, and he stuck you know, pretty much to his guns and, and said that he's preparing to be an outfielder. F, it, it's, it's not been a much time, not that much time has gone by since for this press conference to sink in. And I already have kind of changed my tune a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess here, I think we know Aloy can hit. So the mindset of being an everyday DH is something that he can kind of, em- everybody kept using the word embrace. Uh, he can embrace that over the course of February, March. Mm-hmm. If that's what, if that's what it, comes to with a little bit of work right. in the outfield. I don't have a problem. Here's because I've been the conservative guy on Oscar Colas, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So if let's just say for, for argument's sake here, that Oscar Colas is, doesn't have a great spring. Who's your right fielder? That's a good question. That's mm. a good question. So, it's, well, it might be Gavin Sheets. Uh, no, no. Gavin Sheets was the worst right fielder in defensive runs saved in baseball. I last thought year. that was Vaughn. Vaughn was the eighth worst. <laughs> well, hold on a second. I want to go back because eighth worst. Two of the wor- two of the eight. They, they weren't good. They weren't no, good. I don't want first baseman playing right field anymore. That is no longer an option. So Grafal was on inside the clubhouse on six seven to score, I believe, a week ago or less than a this week ago, a couple days ago, yeah. And he said, "quote." Oscar Colas is going to be given every opportunity to see if he can become our right fielder on a daily basis. Yeah. So what this would, has not what, been communicated apparently to Aloy Jimenez yet. That, what first of all, what would you expect uh, Grafol to say? Secondly, I'm giving you worst case scenario. If he's given every opportunity, now I don't expect him to to, to be a 120 hitter in spring and and look terrible. But let's say he is. Who's your right fielder? Why wouldn't you prepare Aloy Jimenez to be at least get the reps? Right. Whether right. we like it or not, I'm not like I'm not advocating that Aloy Jimenez is the White Sox starting right fielder. What I'm saying is you have at least a guy who plays outfield mm-hmm. on your roster. The the goal is that Oscar Colas wins that job and that Aloy goes to the DH and maybe two out of every seven days Aloy Jimenez is playing right field. Maybe. All right, let's hear from Aloy. This is what he said, speaking with reporters on a Zoom about his right field situation and what he's planning to do this season. Well, I'm really preparing myself right now to play in the outfield. Uh, last year, it was uh, in a situation. I was in a situation that I need to DH more than play outfield, but this year I'm really preparing myself to play more games in the outfield than DH. Lloyd, how are we doing? Good, how are you? Just fine. I know it's your desire to play outfield, but if you were asked to DH, would you and spend most of your time DH, would you embrace that role as DH? Uh, I don't know because, like I say early, uh, last year, because I was the Asian more than the outfield, it was because I got surgery. And uh, and I understand that. Uh, but this year I've been working really hard to play in the outfield more than the age. So, uh, I don't, I don't really think uh, that I'm going to accept it because if I'm working hard, it's because I want to get better and I want to play in the outfield. All right, Guff, lots to unpack there. Clearly, he is going to spring training with the mindset of a lot more outfield. 
we, watching him over the course of his career, have been bracing every time a ball is hit to him, oh, he's going to get hurt. He's been hurt so many times in the outfield. Now, his big injury last season was running the bases. I think we all feel the same thing about Aloy. I don't know anyone out there who is just, like, pounding the table that says Aloy Jimenez needs to play exclusively or almost a majority or even at all in the outfield. I mean, there's some people who just don't want him in the outfield, period. I'm getting closer and closer to that just because I can't take it anymore, him getting hurt. He stayed healthy after he got hurt last season because he was mainly DHing. I was hoping, expecting that. This is going to be very interesting to see how this unfolds in spring training. All right, so now I'm going to the other side of the argument here. Uh, because of every time a ball was hit to left field the last few years, and we were like, oh, my God, don't, do, yeah. don't, don't fall, don't dive, don't just let it drop, all that stuff. Now you're asking him to learn a new position, okay? I mean, in outfield, a lot of the things are the same, but when you're in a different corner, there's different expectations, there's different routes, the ball comes off the bat different, et cetera, et cetera. Why put that on the guy that you need in the lineup more than any other player? Especially after the season this team had with health and the seasons that he's had with health. Two themes of the podcast, two themes of the uh, Zoom availability. He clearly wants to play outfield, and he, all he kept saying was, I want to play more games. He mentioned 150. If he's playing right field, he's not playing 150 games. So what's the best way to do it? That's what I'm saying. Fine, prepare as a right fielder or prepare as a left fielder and be Ben Attendee's backup and expel him, you know, expel him a day or two a week. We, the White Sox need the most success that Aloya Amenes can provide the White Sox is at the plate, period. I'm not yeah. breaking any news there. So the why wouldn't you protect that asset? Why wouldn't you protect that asset? He doesn't have to like it on January 23rd as we tape this. He doesn't have to like that. Maybe but, uh, what the White Sox are doing is they are hoping that Oscar Colas will play so well in right field, he'll just win the job over Aloy Jimenez in right. Giving Aloy him instead of telling Aloy, hey, Aloy, you're going to be our full-time DH, instead they're going, you know what, Aloy? You try to be the right fielder, and we'll see what happens in spring training. Yeah, I think that that knowing that you have somebody like Cola, that's the, that's the benefit of having a guy like Oscar Colas who has that talent that can skip basically an entire level of the minor leagues and, and be an everyday right fielder. Plus, the White Sox aren't asking Oscar Colas to be a 300 30, right. 100 guy. They, 245 might be acceptable if he plays a solid defense, can learn on the job, bury him in the lineup, and as the season goes, he starts to figure it out yeah. a little bit more. That might be enough. For the, he doesn't, I don't think he needs to do anything, you know, uh, off the charts, astronomical to win the job. I don't think he has to hit 515 with nine homers and lead the Cactus yeah. League. I just think he needs to show signs that he can – be the guy every single day, put the work in, know what it's like to play back-to-back-to-back-to-back to back to back to back days in late in spring when this team is talking about winning an AL Central Championship. The other thing that Aloy said, there's actually two things. Here's one more. He was asked about his conditioning this offseason, and he, I think Daryl Van Scullen of the Sun-Times asked, and Aloy's answer, he kind of had this like sheepish look on his face, and he said, he responded by saying, well, I've got a surprise for you. Uh, it'll be revealed, I guess, at spring training. So apparently he's lost some weight, maybe. That is my guess as to what he was talking about. So if he's lighter out there, you hope, okay, maybe maybe he'll stay healthier. I don't know. He'll be faster in the outfield. What did you think about what he said? Well, logging onto the Zoom, I just I thought he looked lighter. I, I, I didn't think this is like, face. His face. Yeah, that's we all know. Uh when you when you start losing some LBs, the face looks a little mm -hmm. healthier. Um, I swear, I, just looking at him, I mean, it's hard to tell, but he just, he did look a little fresher yeah, and like a little leaner and he needed quite to frankly, he weight. needed to probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, especially if he's, if you're talking about being an outfielder, he had to, right. But the way his body has been banged up the last yeah. couple of seasons, extra pounds are not healthy for no. a guy like that when, and the injuries, it's not like you're going to the same injury all the time. I mean, these right. injuries are piling up. So we're going to watch this. This is going to be a big story in spring training. Right field, DH, Aloy, Oscar Colas. But then there is this continuing theme 
this continuing subplot that I was already going to be bringing up in the podcast that we had planned. It didn't have to do specifically with this topic. The podcast we were going to do was we were going to grade all the offseason moves in the AL Central. And we'll still do that. But one thing I was talking about with the White Sox was I felt like, okay, they've made some moves. It's a little incomplete. It's incomplete for me just because I'm still trying to answer that question. Who is the leader in the clubhouse? We know about the pitching staff, but you need to have a different leader as your position player squad. Obviously, they lost Jose Abreu. So this was on my mind, and they haven't filled the void, as far as I can tell. So, on the Zoom, Aloy Jimenez (laughs) was asked, with Abreu in Houston, who can step up and lead? So Aloy shrugs, gives a long pause, and said this. Hey, Aloy. Um... Do you have people on this team that you feel like can be leaders uh, in the absence of, of Abreu now that he's gone? Are there other people who can step up in his place? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't have uh, the answer of that. Like, I know, uh, if I tell you a name, I don't know. I don't think I'm going to tell you because it's like that, you know, so I'm not going to lie. All right. So there's your answer from Aloy Jimenez, which says to me, there is no answer. We have not filled that void. They have not filled that void. And what does that even say about what's going on? Like all my concerns about the clubhouse last season and the lack of leadership is basically confirmed by Aloy Jimenez right there. Like he, he's like, uh, uh, we don't really have one. I don't want to lie. And I, I don't, what do you think he meant by that? I mean, I have, I have theories as to what he meant, but what do you think? Well, he's not going to just throw out names for the answer, for the sake of answering the question. If he doesn't feel like it's true. So then he's burying a guy mm-hmm. and not believing in him all at once. So I'd rather have him answer that way. than answer, then, then throw a guy under the bus. Yeah. Cause then, you know, what's going to happen. He mentions a guy. What's the question that's going to be when that guy's available? Yeah. Hey, you're the guy. What? I didn't know that. Look, I, I, we've said it, Chuck. It's been a theme of our offseason podcast all year. Mm-hmm. I, it's been as big of an acquisition or need on this team as any that they've yeah. signed or not signed or acquired. Lack of leadership. And if sorry, I if, if you're wondering why I did a Nelson Cruz podcast. If you're wondering why I see him at the winter meetings and I'm like, I got to get Nelson Cruz because, you know, (laughs) whatever I can do, which is nothing. I'm thinking here's I know what's needed. I feel like I know what's needed, among other things in this clubhouse. And they've addressed a lot of these needs. They have pitcher, uh, bet attendee, left left handed bat, left fielder. But like the whole leadership thing. Now, where would Nelson Cruz play? How much would he play? I don't know. But like this is still a thing. Now you can question whether how important it is. I think it's a big deal to me that they have a position player who is a leader. They don't seem to have that right now. Chuck, for two years, they hired a guy. If if you're not hiring your manager to be your leader, you better have multiple leaders in your clubhouse. Mm -hmm. And for two years, they didn't have a manager as a leader and they didn't have multiple guys in their clubhouse. So now in essence, you hired maybe the leader of the team. Maybe the white Sox feel like they've hired their leader and the leadership void in the clubhouse by their manager. That rarely works Mm -hmm. because managers don't want to be the, in the walking through the clubhouse every day to make the rah, rah guy. That guy is just, they're going to tune that out. And I don't think Rafal wants to be that guy either. I think he wants to be provide leadership to allow those guys to lead in the clubhouse. And I, I think Tony LaRusso took this job thinking there they were leaders. Him. I agree with and you. And he realized, whoa, wait a second. They're they're not what I thought they And then were when they be. turned to him for answers, he was like, I don't know. Yeah. I don't want to, you know, crap. This is not the TLR podcast, but I'm with you. Like it's you can't coach leadership. Mm-hmm. You can't coach it. It's a it's a it's a talent. It's not a trait. You are you can take classes on it, read books on it, but if it if that's not who you are, if that's not your personality, you can't just be that forced guy. There's not going to be a guy that walks into the clubhouse this spring that had never 
voiced his opinion before right. and say, guys, I got it. Give me the baton. That's not how it works. It's very difficult, and the Sox had tried to bring in guys in the past to be that leader if they could. Jimmy Rollins, Todd Frazier, right? And even on paper, it might seem like, oh, just put him in the clubhouse, he'll lead. doesn't always work. So it's a tall task for the front office to find somebody. So I was trying to think, like, biggest possible names of someone. I'm like, Nelson Cruz, Michael Brantley, like, Yuli Gurriel, someone – of that ilk who could help. They haven't found it yet. And hearing what Eloy said right there, it's uh it's, it's a void. Keep in mind too. That's a hard thing for like, let's, let's, let's use your Nelson, Nelson Cruz. It's hard for that guy to walk into a new clubhouse, even though he's done it many times and he's in his forties to kind of say like, here's, here's, you know, let me get my scroll out. Here's how we're going to do it. Mm-hmm. it. That's also hard. Cause that person needs to walk into the clubhouse, feel it out. Look left, look right, start meeting some guys, understanding who they are, and then kind of getting the message out. Now, that's why you have to try to get that guy now so right. you can have all spring to do that. But, look, someone's going to have to step up. And quite frankly, it's going to have to come from that leadership group or leadership group. It's going to have to come from that group that the White Sox tied their horses to. It's going to have to come from the Aloy Menaces, the Luis Roberts, the Yoan Mancadas. It's not like it's, at this point, Yasmani Grandal is in year four. It's not coming from him, right? Like, I mean, how disappointed is it? I know as a White Sox fan. Tony Gill, step it in here. It's, I love it. it's very disappointing <laughs> to get the confirmation of something that you kind of already knew what was going on, mm-hmm. um, but then have it confirmed by, verbalized. and verbalized by a player in that locker room that the guys that the White Sox have brought up, aren't not one of them became a leader of the group. Yeah. That is extremely disappointing. And once you view a certain person a certain way for so long Mm -hmm. and you expect that person to change now, well, you've already painted that picture. Right. About about them in your head. So how do you how do you expect them to grow? Like Guff just said, it has to come from that group. But they've been the same way for so long. Like how do you expect them to take that next step that's in why, maturity? Right. That's why I wanted some I wanted a hired gun because it wasn't yeah. working. Now, things could work out like they did in 2021. I mean, this is a scenario. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but where hey, things just fall into place. They're winning games. They're having great seasons. You don't necessarily need the leader rah rah guy maybe, right? But it's when things go south, like they did last year, where there was just that's when Things get revealed, warts get revealed, and you need problem solvers. That's where leadership can come into place. And if that happens again, we'll see. Or you need somebody in the driver's seat, your manager in this case, to take the pressure off the guys. And I think he has the ability to do that. I.e. 2005, when the the shit was hitting the the fan, fan, and 15 went to one and a half, who's the guy who stepped up to the mic every day? Who's the guy that took all the attention off the clubhouse and said, put it on me? It was Ozzie Guillen. That's where we, that's where we knew how strong of a leader Ozzie Guillen was. Do you want to hear something very ironic that just popped in my head? Yep. This is funny. This is ir- irony times 100. So it is 2005. It is September. I am at Wrigley Field in the middle of while this whole White Sox lead has gone from whatever it was, 15, 15 to one and a half. Yep. To one and a half, okay. It's probably at like three at this point, or maybe even two. I am working on a story on the 1983 White Sox. Remember the, those stories I did oh, I in 05 for the playoffs? Yeah. I interview Tony La Russa, <laughs> who's the manager of the St. Louis Cardinals. I am in the dugout. He knows I cover the White Sox. He says to me, what is Ozzie Guillen doing? Hmm. And what he was – Winning the, the World Series. Well, no, no, no. He wasn't winning the no, World Series. Ozzy was saying stuff to the media, trying to take the pressure off his players. And he was, and at the time, and I'm defending Tony here, at the time it wasn't working because the lead kept shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And Ozzy was just, you know, doubling down. I forgot specifically what he was saying, but he was just saying crazy stuff. It ended up working. But isn't that funny that it was but, Tony but, La Russa but- who was asking me what was going on with Ozzy at that time? But that's Ozzy understanding the pulse of his clubhouse and yeah. not and knowing that he's got to keep doubling down. Yeah. Because if he doesn't, the attention will go into the clubhouse, right. and if it gets into the clubhouse and into their minds, of, and looking at the newspaper, you know what yeah. I mean, that it's going to poison it. 
And so the only thing he could do as the leader of the team yeah. is say, screw it. If, I'm, if we're going to go down, let me take the ship yeah. down. Right. And if you would have asked Tony La Russa today or even two months later about what Ozzy did, I'm sure he'd be like, oh, that was a smart move. But at the time, no, and look, a lot we of people were, were panicking. It. Yeah, We yeah, were all yeah, questioning, like, yeah. what is Ozzy doing? But yeah, it's perspective, right? right? Time gives perspective, and we've had a lot more perspective on it now. And and even the guys who were in that club, I'll say it. Like, they did you know, but the thing with, and I don't, 05 is 05. It's a special, it's, it's yeah. a forever special. But they had a lot of personalities and guys that could take command there of the room. There was a lot of leadership a in A lot of room. command of yeah. the room from yeah. a lot of different people. Yes. And I think the White Sox have the command. The people who have the command of the room right now for the White Sox are pitchers. Right. And that's good they, for the pitching staff, but good not the, the everyday staff, players. Like Lance Lynn's one of those guys, but yeah. Lance Lynn will tell you they don't, it yep. shouldn't come from a guy who pitches every fifth day. They need a Lance Lynn who is a position player. Yes, because they got they already have it under control. When Danny Mendick in May last year <laughs> said Lance Lynn is the leader of our team and he had not been on the mound yet, yeah. that concern, it jumped off the page to you and I then. Just like what Aloy said is jumping off the page right now. And that's it, it, like it should – it's disappointing. So, you know, to, to, back to Tony's point, it's, it's concerning because no sport is like baseball. There's no, they don't, every single day, you got to put an 8 1 win behind mm -hmm. you and the 9 8 blown loss, blown save loss behind you and keep moving. And if you get on those six, seven game winning streaks, it's easy, right? Yes. Everyone's a leader because we go out, we're mashing. The next day, seven, eight games in a row, now you're going the other way. How are you going to get out of it? Do you have the people? Do you have the tenacity? Do you have the guts? Do you have the courage? Do you have the guy in the room that says, enough is enough? Let's yeah. get going. The Cleveland Guardians are here. And we're not going to take this crap anymore. We're not going to let them push us around when our payroll is twice as much as them. Stop letting Stephen Kwan beat us. Stop letting it be okay. They don't have. I don't think that you got to have that. Yes. Like, it, it's a little bit of football in a baseball clubhouse. You just don't need it every day. You just need it at times. Sometimes when it's good. Sometimes when it's bad. And even when it hits the dog days and things are going okay, and you're four and three, and then three and four. You just need the reminders from the people that you're yeah. with every day, love them, hate them, or in between, that you got enough, that you're a band of brothers, that it's from 1 to 26, that the goal is the same. And I feel like this team could use someone from the outside. They have a, guy, a lot of guys who have been to the playoffs, won World Series, but they almost need someone who has recently done it, who commands respect, and just can see through the trees and be able to say all the right things. Yep. Someone that's got to be out there, and he doesn't have to be the best player. Yeah, but they need someone, and I don't know who that is right now. I know. I mean, look at the Cubs. They signed Eric Hosmer. They may cut him that's in a May. Great move. But there's really no spot for him. Yeah. But they brought him in because of his leadership. Yeah. And whether it gets him to October or whether he's cut on June first, it's it's really it was a, it was a win win because yeah. it cost them nothing. Other people are paying him. They had to pay seven hundred grand. It's a guy like that. You know who he, they should trade for? Just bring in Salvador Perez. Oh yeah, that's that's the that's, that's, that's an easy. Yeah, the, <laughs> the, the Royals are ready. Can we great? Can we wait for the grading of the offseason then, while we wait for that trade to happen? No, I mean I'm just off the top of my head. Like who is who is that guy? Yeah, and like, who's I, that guy? It, 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 to your point, like it doesn't. Who don't think about the position? Like they, if they, I know brought, I'm not thinking about it. I they, just I, need, I, I know yeah. you're talking about like Nelson Cruz. If they bring in a guy that's like, huh, interesting name. Where does he fit? It might be in he the room. He fits in the clubhouse. It might fit in the room. <laughs> yes. And there's still time to make that move. I yeah. think it does matter. Like, if they were going to make one move at this point that would, like, settle me, it would be somebody that's like, this guy's been there. I mean, if I'm the front office and I hear what Aloy just said, I'd be like, okay, this has to be addressed. If, if you're not, the front if, office and you don't know well, that's that, it, that that's the case <laughs> until Aloy said it, that's a problem. Well, it hasn't been addressed. They got three weeks until spring training, roughly. I think the front office knows what the lawyer said. They're supposed to find this guy in three weeks. I, I'm gonna, I, 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 I'm gonna, I'm gonna give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe I mean I know a lot of people don't, right. but if the White Sox were surprised by what a lawyer said today, then that's more damning than the comment itself. I mean, should we just? Um, should I go on my phone and look for a leader? Does that person exist? Man, I'll tell you what. LinkedIn has changed. Looking for leaders. Hold on. Right. <laughs> Sign up. I'm going to apply for the job. That just I'm going to start going to companies that's just uh, the job titles leader. Yeah, I, seriously. <laughs> we, that's what we need. Looking for a leader. NBC uh, According to, uh, I mean, don't say me. According to Aloy Jimenez, there is not a leader. 
We need leaders. All right, hold can't on win with them. Can't do it. What do you need? What do you do? <laughs> I lead. What? I lead. Oh, you're okay. fit. You're right, finalist. Right. I'm. I'm looking for one right now. Okay, Trevor Bauer. No, that is no. We are definitely not looking for. Uh, uh, that's Mike Moustakis. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm looking. See? Is it, see what's happening. I'm looking. Uh, see what's happening. <laughs> I'm looking. So you know, here's here's an interesting one, but he didn't really work. Josh Harrison, but he was here last year. That didn't work, but he's available. But is um, he a leader? Yeah, that's another thing. Yeah, yeah maybe he was allowed. Uh, I mean, t- t- still looking. All stat. Jason still- Castro. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. You the, the list isn't. Uh, I'm looking at the list, Chuck. You know, and it's. You know. Yeah. Cesar Spin. Hernandez doesn't jump at you, huh? <laughs> no, no. Anybody uh, that already has been here. So there might have to be a option. trade. We might need a trade. We've been waiting for the trade. Sox haven't made a trade yet. Yep. Everyone now is like the big. How about Elvis Andrews? See, that's interesting. I keep getting like the, you know, everyone's all the Jazz Chisholm is, or is is yeah, now like yeah, yeah. is now the big Elvis hot. Andrews. If they brought him back, I mean, he came at the end. That's interesting. That's all right. He was probably their biggest leader by the time yeah. the club out. By the time it, that is here. off the top of our heads here on the podcast, that is the best answer. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Do you, Leaders. Do you sacrifice a piece of the talent to get the locker room straightened out by trading one of those dudes? Well, so that's so that's a good you brought that up because I was led to believe that they were open to the possibility of trading one of these guys in the offseason because Rick had kind of alluded to like, hey, we may. We may, he said, I'm paraphrasing, but I don't want to say he like 100% was saying it, but he said we may have to go down the road of maybe trading a guy who we thought was going to be part of our nucleus. Now, was that going to be Aloy Jimenez or Yoan Moncada or whoever it might be? I don't know, but this is a thing. Whatever this was is a thing. It is. Hey, on your drive to Arizona, can you find a leader? Uh, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna find a whole lot uh, on the way between here and Arizona. I'm not sure I'll be able to find any leaders in Looking for uh, leaders. in Tulsa. You never know; they come from different area yeah. codes, zip codes. Oh, I know, I know. Tulsa yeah. needs leaders. A- Amarillo, Texas. I'll be in Amarillo. No, yeah. I mean, there's not there's a whole lot of nothing between Chicago and uh, Phoenix. Yeah. I know it all. <laughs> Got to make sure he's born. They're not usually bred. Got to make exactly. sure they're born. So they could be anywhere. It could be anywhere. So maybe I'll be arriving in Arizona by June. Could I mean, I don't know if I'd help the roster of the White Sox, but I, let's go. I'll give you the. I'll All get right. in Looking there for a leader. Off. Looking for a leader for the White Sox. So uh, this is the pod. This was the pod. Thanks, Aloy. Yes, appreciate you, Claren Vinny. By the way, in I, was, too. I was happy. Like he gave a nice extended answer to the Mike question too. about being appreciate pissed it. off. What? He's saying Vinny. <laughs> uh, Vinny. <laughs> <laughs> so we got Vinny. Okay, okay, maybe, okay. maybe I did Vinny. it again. So here's why I did that. Here's why I did that. Maybe Vinny's. I've done it now twice. <laughs> Vinny Duber yes. is married to Claire. Not me. No. <laughs> Vinny, not our, our good friend Vinny Duber is married to Claire, and I'm always talking with my wife about Vinny and Claire when we do stuff together. So here we have Tony and Claire, and whenever I put your names together, I sometimes say Vinny and Claire and it's just embarrassing. It's all right, Chuck. You're good. This is the second time <laughs> I have done that. Way to go, kid. Yeah, I'm uh, an idiot. Tony and Claire weighing in. This is so funny. And that is a wrap for this edition of the White Sox Talk Podcast, brought to you by Wintrust, your home for White Sox. Check in with free ATMs nationwide. Go to the special White Sox webpage, www.wintrust.com slash Sox. Hawk Harrelson, take it away. Thanks, our Chuck. And this edition of the White Sox Talk Podcast is over!